Hello, Houston. Um, we are um, sitting here um, reminiscing about abnormalities we've known in the past, and uh, today what we're going to do is finish our, um, our treatment of psychopathology, and we're going to conclude psychotherapy also. So we're going to finish getting you sick, and then we're going to fix you up by the end of the lecture today. So hang on, it'll be a bit of a ride. Um, we had finished talking about the anxiety-based disorders last time, and today I want to jump in and, and look at the, the two other forms that, that are of some interest, um, considerable interest, actually. Uh, one is the, um, the schizophrenias, um, generally called, and, and the psychotic disorders that are, that are generally associated, that is in that same general group of disorders. As I said, or intimated in the, in the last discussion, one of the problems we have, we meaning psychologists, have in diagnosing schizophrenia is that it is, that it is an extraordinarily complex condition. Um, these are the major factors listed on the screen are one of the lists of such disorders or factors, symptoms, that are indicative of, of uh, schizophrenia that one author has suggested. Um, and the presence of any one of those um, emotions in, or, or disturbances, if you want, any one of those symptoms in sufficient amount is enough for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Which symptom shows up will determine which, which diagnosis is actually a, um, applied. But in essence, you can get any combination of two, three, in some instances, in bizarre instances, you may get all seven instances represented. So it represents an extraordinarily complex diagnostic problem. And if we look at the specific symptoms, you begin to, to understand exactly how, um, how difficult the, the diagnosis itself becomes. Here is a major source of difficulty. What is listed here, and I'll leave this up here for a couple minutes so you can kind of get an appreciation for what we're actually talking about here. In this situation, what we've got are the major symptoms down the left side of the screen that show up in any psychological disorder. So we're not... A, we're not applying a specific diagnosis here. We're simply saying these are some of the things that may show up by way of unusual behaviors. Um, and across the top are some of the traditional major diagnostic labels that are, that are applied. Uh, schizophrenia being one, uh, manic depressive, that is now instead called bipolar disorder as a second one. The third are generally the anxiety-based disorders, traditionally called neuroses. And then finally, uh, various kinds of character disorders that we're not actually going to talk about here. What's listed in, in the, each of the columns on each line is the percentage of times that the symptom showing up on the left has been diagnosed in each of the conditions that is shown in the column. So to give you an example, the most frequent diagnosis or symptom occurring in a, in a traditional diagnosis is the presence of suspiciousness. That is where the person is suspicious of his or her friends, family, the world, and so forth, in instances where the ultimate diagnosis is schizophrenia. There is another symptom that shows up almost as frequently, and that is depression in the bipolar disorders, the unipolar, um, not so much the unipolar, uh, I'm sorry, yes, both the unipolar and the bipolar disorders where depression is an element. And then you'll notice also that 58% of the time somebody who has an anxiety-based disorder will also exhibit some degree of depression. Notice, however, that other than those three symptoms and conditions which are cited, there is no other symptom that occurs as much as 40% of the time in any disorder. And therein lies the biggest diagnostic problem we have. And that is that there is a huge array of symptoms, any one of which may show up, um, the rest of which may be totally absent, depending on the, the actual disorder. And so it becomes an extraordinarily complex matching operation in the head of the clinician or, or psychiatrist, uh, whoever, is actually making the, the diagnosis. This is one of the reasons that even with the aid of something like the DSM or any of the other world-based category systems that are available, you still have some degree of, of, of disagreement among clinicians and psychiatrists, simply because of the, the, as you might appreciate, the very complex matching operation that is involved in this kind of a, a diagnostic problem. Now, when we look at the types of schizophrenia that can, in fact, actually be um, diagnosed, there are a series of, of five that are, that are traditionally labeled. One is just generalized, undifferentiated schizophrenia. A second type that has been around for many, many years is what's called paranoid schizophrenia. Um, I can give you a specific example of that. Um, Charles Manson of the Manson family, um, who was responsible for a series of four or five murders, um, in a drug-crazed um, 
colony in, in uh, Southern California about 20 or 25 years ago um, was an example of a paranoid schizophrenic. Another who has been diagnosed that way and is publicly known is Sirhan Sirhan, the assassin of Robert Kennedy in, in a hotel in Los Angeles uh, in the late 1960s. Um, those people, both of them, have come up at various times for, for release. And in the instance of Manson, for instance, he is testifying that, that uh, has testified in such hearings that his goal is to go back and recreate the same loving family relationship that he had, which produced the five murders um, long ago. And he really today does not have a clue as to the travesty that he created on the, on the lives that he destroyed, that he and his colony uh, destroyed. And with Sirhan Sirhan, um, there is no public acknowledgement on his part, no sense of responsibility for what happened. In fact, as an example, he was heard to mutter at the time, repeatedly at the time uh, Robert Kennedy was murdered, the phrase over and over again, I am the savior of my people. And in essence, what you're seeing there are two examples of, of symptoms that often show up in this type of disorder, and that is the, the delusion of, of um, uh, prosecution, persecution, and the delusion of grandeur. That one phrase, I am the savior of my people, captures both of those. In essence, the very idea that he is saving them suggests that he's somehow above everybody else and, and in greater power. And the implicit idea that he's saving them from something is also implied by the statement. So there is clearly a vision of, of persecution in that, in that one phrase. And he is basically unenlightened uh, in all these years. Paranoid schizophrenia normally occurs peak between age 25 and 40. Um, it's less severe than, than the catatonic, which we're going to look at here in, in a minute. Um, but the, the delusions are there, the, the illogic in, in um, uh, intellectual dis discussions, hallucinations, uh, feelings of persecution, and so forth. This is a person who is particularly likely to intellectualize. You get into an argument with them, and unless if you grant their initial assumptions, you may end up losing the argument purely on logic grounds. So the way to handle that, then, is if you're, if you're trying to deal with them rationally, and that may be questionable anyway, um, is to simply attack the assumptions on which their initial um, argument is, um, is based. But they're a very complex, highly intellectualized kind of um, disorder. Another kind is a catatonic. I spoke once before about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. If you remember in the ward scenes of that movie, or if you ever get to see it, there was a guy who stood in the corner of the, of the, of the ward almost through the entire movie with his hands wrapped around a mop in a bucket. And he just stood there like that through, through many scenes in, in the movie. That is an example of, of, of um, a catatonic schizophrenic, where there are oftentimes uh, physical symptoms that show up and will persist. One of the things that you will sometimes see is what's called waxy flexibility. So if somebody happens to be walking or, or, or standing, with their, if they're, for some reason they've raised their arm to here, it may take 30 minutes or more for that arm to actually return to what you and I would call the resting position. When we're done, we simply relax and, and it goes back to a resting state. In a catatonic, on the other hand, it may take as much as 30 minutes before that arm actually returns to the, um, to the resting uh, position. Um, I almost hesitate to tell you this. When I was walking, when I was in sixth grade, I decided that it was very inefficient if I was doing something here, then to have to put my hands down and later bring them up to do whatever I was doing again. So for about two days, I walked around. Luckily, it was a weekend, so my friends never saw me doing this. But I actually walked around for about two days, operating under the assumption that it was more efficient on average to leave your hands where you had last been doing things. Um, and then just have them right close to whatever you were going to be working on next, the idea being that we normally work on the same thing as, for instance, running a keyboard or something like that. And my parents reported and harassed me many times later about the kind of bizarre postures that I walked around in for, for um, several days. Um, that isn't necessarily schizophrenic, and I will deny it if you ever accuse me of it. But, um, but in essence, what you're seeing there is, is uh, in, in the slide illustration there, is, is the kind of behavior that you might see. And, and it's called waxy flexibility, because it's exactly as if this person were cast in a, you know, in a wax statue in Madame Trousseau's museum, and you crank the heat up. And it's, it's about the rate at which the arm then would fall ever so slowly. Um, back to the resting position. The other kind of conditions we can also look at are disorganized schizophrenia and finally residual schizophrenia. Um, these are some of the most complex and severe disorders that we face in, in uh, traditional mental hospital treatment facilities. Now if we compare schizophrenic 
schizophrenia with anxiety-based disorders, you get some rather interesting differences, and I think this will capture for you the essence of the difference between the two. If we look first of all, for instance, at, um, at um, and if we could kill my picture for a minute, just let's look at the whole screen here, thanks. Um, the impairment is general in a schizophrenic, that is, they will have to be hospitalized uh, and watched essentially constantly. For the anxiety-based disorders, you and I may be able to, de to detect when somebody is experiencing an anxiety-based disorder, but the impairment of their ability to function is relatively limited. That is, they may have some problems, but they can still generally continue to function in the everyday life. The deviance is obvious. It is absent or at least well disguised in the anxiety-based disorders. Thirdly, the schizophrenic is disoriented. That is, they, they often have lost touch with where they are, who they are, what time of day, week, month, year, and in stage of their life that they're, that they're in. But that disorientation definitely is not there in the anxiety-based disorders. And in contrast, in terms of insightfulness, as I was describing for both Sirhan Sirhan, uh, Sirhan, Sirhan and Charles Manson, there is no insight into, into the difficulties that they've caused. Interestingly enough, however, in the anxiety-based disorders, that, that insight definitely has to be there. And if you think back to the psychoanalytic description of what's actually going on, the insight has to be there because the, the personality, the, the ego, if you want to think about it in psychoanalytic terms, has to know what it needs to defend itself against. So in essence, the insight is there in somebody who has an anxiety-based disorder. And um, Chris Sizemore, Eve of um, Three Faces of Eve fame, uh, spent some bit of time in lecture the day she was um, visiting us here at, at the University of Houston talking about the fact that she knew for a long time she had a major disorder. That is, it was something that was seriously disordered in her life, and she spent the better part of a quarter century looking for the help, which ultimately solved her problem. But the insight is there, and, and most people with a, an anxiety-based disorder are, in fact, actively seeking to get it, get it fixed. Anxiety-based disordered people are not a danger to one another. The one instance where somebody with a schizophrenic disorder could be um, of danger is what is traditionally called an acute psychotic episode. Right at the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, there is a scene that illustrates what's involved there. The Indian chief, who had become quite good friends with the, the person who was the main character in the film and who was ultimately subjected to some very abusive therapy, um, in a rage right at the end of the movie, put his arms under a marble sink, which was anchored to the floor in the men's room, and simply tore the sink right out of the floor, pipes and all, and then picked up the base and used that as a battering ram to hammer his way out of the hospital. Under those conditions, a person who is diagnosed schizophrenic would be considered to be having what is called an acute psychotic episode, and under those conditions can be very dangerous. And it's because of that and because of the unpredictability as to when those episodes will happen that the, the typical treatment is, involves, among other things, permanent hospitalization, that is residential treatment in a, um, in a state mental hospital. And finally then, if we look at the complexity of the, of the causing factors, what we find is that, that they're, they're quite complexly determined in, uh, in schizophrenia. That is, there are several different sources um, of potential disorders in this kind of a situation, um, in schizophrenic disorders, relative to um, the anxiety-based disorders. So with that, we're going to switch over to the treatment now of um, physical therapy um, and, and look at not just physical therapy, but the various types of therapy. Um, when it comes time to actually gain treatment, um, there are a number of different treatment options that you have. Um, some of which involve, for instance, uh, community mental health centers, others of which may involve going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a variety of, um, of other people. And this is a curve that shows you in a different way the graph that we looked at in the simple psych book um, uh, in, the, in the previous lecture. And I've, the data is somewhat dated here, but I keep using it because it illustrates the main point that I want to make here. And that is the graph on the left is a pie chart that shows you where treatment was being offered in 1955 and the percentage of people who were being treated in that way. And you will notice at that time that the primary thing, the primary treatment source was state and county mental hospitals, that is residential facilities. Only 23% of the, of the mentally disordered in this country on average were being treated in outpatient psychiatric services, and most of the rest involved some kind of inpatient treatment, for instance, general hospital psychiatric inpatient units, which is in the, in the light green there. So that the vast majority of these were residential treatments. Look at what's happened 20 years later. 
1975, that's the distribution that you now see. And that is that now 47%, that is the number of people treated on outpatient basis, has more than doubled. And that ratio has actually continued now. It's up over 50% now. A whole new area has been developed that did not even exist in the mid-50s, and that is community mental health treatment centers, the, the uh, magenta, I think we called it the other day, uh, color. Um, and look at, what hap look at what's happened to the number of people, or the proportion of people, in state and county mental hospitals. The absolute number has been cut by about 85 to 90 percent in modern times. That is, we have about 90 percent fewer people being treated in big, permanent resident state county mental hospitals. We just don't build those anymore. And again, it's because of tranquilizers, which is a physical therapy. But one of the positive benefits of tranquilizers, and I'm going to show you some problems with it, but one of the positive benefits is that it has calmed down a lot of us so that we don't have to be, and I'm speaking generically here, that we humans don't have to be permanently hospitalized as long as we'll stay on the meds or until the problem itself is fixed. And this curve, these, these pie charts, really show you the basis for that significant shift in, in the offering of, of uh, the treatment of mental disorders. Now, what we're talking about here is, is several different ways in which you may end up being um, sent into or, or achieve um, the call for, for treatment. One is that you refer yourself, as we said earlier with the humanistic definitions, if you don't feel good, you're going to go seek help. So that's one possible basis. A second is you may be sent in by a court of law. A third possibility is that, that um, for medical or religious or personal reasons, you may decide that it's worth going to get treatment. Uh, and finally then, uh, potentially a psychologist may, may, you know, in interacting with you, may suggest that, that uh, you need to seek a, a more permanent form of, of treatment than just, uh, you know, going to counsel at the counseling center here at the University of Houston or something like that. If you're going into most major psychotherapeutic programs, one of the first things you're going to go through is a very extensive intake interview. This is a very important observational point for whatever group is going to end up treating you. The reason being that in essence this is the first time without necessary bias as to what's wrong with you or what you think is wrong and what's the best thing to do for you, they can interview you with a relatively unbiased perspective on your part. That is, it can be very important in, in soliciting information from you that is unbiased by having listened to psychologists talk about your problem and so forth and so on. So it can be very important as, as a source of initial information that is relatively unvarnished by, by your subsequent views. So the intake interview turns out to be a very important component. In, um, in uh, a second thing that will also go on is, is um, a considerable degree of assessment of your medical state. That is a, a frequent component of the intake interview is the recommendation that you have a complete physical exam in order to rule out or identify any chemical imbalances or, or disease-related conditions, medical conditions that may be causing the, the disorder that you're actually experiencing. I talked once before um, about uh, President George Bush won, um, who had a problem with uh, his thyroid, which led to him normally as a very affable person, all of a sudden over a multiple week period suddenly becoming quite aggressive and, and very kind of combative with the press with, with whom he had generally enjoyed quite good relations. And that turned out to be a medical imbalance rather than a personality disorder that he had. So a medical exam is, is often a, a component of the, of the intake process regardless of what strategy you're going to end up being treated by. Now, when I use a word like psychotherapy, this is what I'm actually talking about. It is essentially a professional helping relationship. That is, in essence, what's involved in, in, in psychotherapy. Now, how we've gotten to, to the, the therapeutic techniques that we use now has covered quite a range, and there have been some very significant historical changes in the way we deal with mental disorders. Probably the worst was the, the kind of thing illustrated by the Salem witch trials in, in the Massachusetts colony 200, 250 years ago now um, on the East Coast in, in our country here, where there were literally people who were being dunked on, on uh, dunking stools into the ocean water. Now, it sounds very barbaric, but the theory at the time was actually legitimate. That is, the logic was wrong. The theory was not correct, but the treatment followed logically from the theory, which is one reason we've gone through this in terms of theory first, um, abnormality second, and, and uh, psychopathology abnormality second, and treatment last. The idea was, the whole reason for the, for the dunking stool was that this was normally done in the winter so that you were dressed down to, to a very little, limited amount of coverage and literally dunked into ice cold water. And the idea was what they were trying to do was to literally drive the evil spirits out of your body. 
That is, they were trying to make the body such an uncomfortable residual place, residential place for the, for the evil spirits, that they would in fact depart from you. And so the net result was that as barbaric as it was, that was illustrative of, of the logic that was, that was um, present at the time. Um, that whole thing also involved the idea that you were possessed in some way. That is, the, the original view of mental illness um, was that the body was somehow possessed of evil spirits of, of one form or another. There's a good illustration of that in the opening scenes of the movie Amadeus, if you ever get a chance to see that. The, the then psychotherapists, and I, I hesitate to call them that at the time, but the, the people who were going in to try to help uh, Salieri um, were in the very early scenes of the movie are walking through the, the, um, the mental hospital I mean, they had to be let in a door, and then they walked past people that were straight-jacketed, who were running, running around in various stages of undress and, and just general chaos, but they were all locked behind a high wall. Um, and the idea at that time was that you were literally possessed, and so you were put in there allegedly for your own benefit, but essentially it was to protect society from those who were, were in fact uh, possessed. Um, when I accepted a job at the University of South Carolina, my first academic appointment in, in um, um, 1967, the State House, the capital of South Carolina, was at one end of Bull Street, and a psychological institution, a state uh, mental hospital, was at the other end of, of Bull Street. And there were some, some obvious political jokes that be ma could be made on that. But there was an 18-foot high wall that surrounded that entire mental facility. And I actually was, I didn't believe it, so I went to check it. On the top was broken glass literally buried into the concrete around the entire facility. Now, they had long since opened the wall, and it was a free access institution. But that was an institution that had been built some 100 or 120 years earlier. And it very much reflected the significant changes that had really taken in the treatment of the disorder. Because at one time, if, if you were diagnosed mentally ill, you were simply thrown away. I mean, you were institutionalized, and you didn't have a prayer of getting out. Now, the big change occurred in, in Paris in 1792 when a fellow by the name of Philippe Pinel was appointed Commissioner of Mental Health for, for France. And his first action was to go into a mental hospital in Paris and unchain the, the, uh, the patients. And in fact, that act really represented the point, or psychologically, when society began to make a turn away from viewing people as possessed and instead mentally imbalanced or, or behaving abnormally in some way. We still had a long way to go, but that was really the first move away from thinking of people as possessed and simply instead having some kind of serious um, personal problem that needed some, some, uh, some treatment, some help in, in being corrected. There are two people in the latter 1800s in this country who had a real impact on the, on the delivery of mental health services. The one, and they had a kind of a yin-yang or, or a good-bad effect on, on the process, Dorothea Dix was going around the country in the latter half of, of the um, 19th century, latter 1800s, lecturing about the benefits of psychological treatment and, and urging people to seek psychological help uh, for their disorders. The problem that she created was that it created a huge load on a mental treatment facility that really was not prepared for that large influx of people that started happening in the 1800s when people turned to the, to the then available mental hospitals for help. The other, and in some ways perhaps the even more impactful person, was a, a person by the name of Clifford Beers, who in 1908 published a really interesting book called A Mind That Found Itself. Beers was a, a soldier in the Civil War in this country, 1860-1865. He had a brother who was on the opposing side in that war. And the result was that he, what, what the war generated for him was very serious psychological problems because any time he was firing out into the dust, the confusion, the blackness, the, the fog, he never knew when he might be firing at and potentially wound or kill his brother. And so he came out of the war with very serious psychological problems um, and ultimately sought psychological help and was put into an institution by his own admission um, and worked for a number of years before he was able to get his problems all sorted out and, and, and you know, comfortably step out of the institution, be released. He wrote a book about that experience afterwards, and it's a magnificent read because, in essence, what he did was to talk about the two different forces in his mind that were really at battle within his head as to which was going to control him. It was the forces of irrationality and the difficulties he had generated out of the war opposing the forces of rationality. And so he basically presents his problem as a civil war conflict within his own head, 
But in the process of doing so, what he also did was to describe the way he was treated in the latter 1800s. And that book drew a lot of attention when it was published and became actually, uh, Beers ultimately became the, the uh, founder of the American Mental Health Association once he got out. So he had a very positive impact on, on, um, on the, the treatment of the mentally disordered. And it was really his book, more than anything else, that led to the modern mental health movement in this country. But it was two other events that ultimately um, put it on the map. Um, and that was, first of all, two wars. One was World War II during the early 1940s, and the other was the Vietnam conflict during the late 60s and 1970s. Both of those produced a lot of infantry um, who had serious difficulties with the war, but they also had veterans benefits, and they came home demanding help for various psychological problems, and that really put psychology on the map in terms of the psychotherapy forms that are now available and, and widely offered. There are a large number of different people who can offer psychotherapy, and I thought it would be interesting for a moment to um, to, um, um, to go over those with you. Um, one of them is what's called a clinical psychologist. A clinical psychologist is someone who has a PhD in psychology as I do, but has concentrated specifically in clinical psychology, where my original training was in, was in cognitive psych. They have gone through a one-year internship after completing their PhD, a supervised internship, and then can take license um, exams to, to practice clinical psychology actively. So that's a person who's had typically four years of undergraduate school and five, six, or seven years of graduate and then postgraduate training, uh, specifically with psychological processes. The only difference between a clinical psychologist and a counseling psychologist in general is the severity of the problems of the people with whom they work. That is, a clinical psychologist is most likely to work with people who have a, um, a psychotic or, or schizophrenic disorder or potentially one of the more serious mood disorders or anxiety-based disorders um, as, as we've talked about them. Another one is a doctor of psychology. This was a degree that was actually started in the late 1960s and really touched a, a, it addressed a need. Basically, this was developed originally at the University of Illinois. What it now involves is um, somebody, well, the point was basically that the PhD is a research degree. And so to get a, a PhD in clinical psychology, you have to do a major piece of research. That is one of the demands that society school authorities put on us as we, as we grant PhDs. But somebody pointed out in, in the 60s that clinical psychologists know, need to know how to read the literature and deliver services but many of them don't actually conduct research. That is, if you do, then you get a PhD in clinical psychology. But you really don't need anything more than knowledge of how to consume uh, and, and understand the research. And so what was proposed by the University of Illinois and what is now widely available in this country is a degree that is called the PsyD, or Doctor of Psychology. In essence, that's somebody who has the equivalent of a PhD training, but it is entirely in clinical psychology. That is, in the administering of tests, the interpretation of tests, the delivering of, of psychotherapy, the diagnostic processes, and so forth. So in essence, what you could think of it, if you want, is kind of an applied clinical psychologist, is what, what a doctor of psychology would represent. Another is a psychoanalyst. This is the only one that is anchored to a particular theory. Uh, and that is, a psychoanalyst is simply somebody who uh, has training in psychoanalysis and has him or herself been psychoanalyzed. Traditionally, also has an, a medical degree, degree, but that isn't absolutely necessary. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. Four years of medical school and then goes into psychological training. That is, their internship then is in um, the, the treatment of psychological disorders. So an, uh, a psychiatrist is the only one who can operate. Traditionally, what I would have said is that that was also the only person who could prescribe drugs. That differentiation is in the process of breaking down because it occurred to the National Institutes of Health that oftentimes the, the research that is done to justify that drugs work and have a targeted impact are done by PhDs, whether in neurology or in, in psychology or pharmacy. And yet all of a sudden, once the, the drug is demonstrated to have a positive effect, whoops, well, only MDs can prescribe it. And there are programs available now. We have in our own Department of Psychology here a program in clinical neuropsychology which people whose, whose graduates actually have taken extensive courses in the medical center here in Houston. And they have all the neurological knowledge necessary to prescribe drugs. So I'm going to predict that that breakdown is gradually going to, to or, or that that differentiation between psychiatrists and clinical <coughs> psychologists is gradually going to disappear. Um, 
Finally, then, we've got some others. A psychiatric nurse would be an RN with, with uh, professional training specifically in dealing with psychological disorders, a social worker, and then even an occupational therapist who might in one way or another be involved in the treating of, of uh, mental disorder. A paraprofessional, then, is someone who any of, any of you in the class could potentially work as a paraprofessional. Even a dedicated high school student might work as a, as a paraprofessional. If you've got enough um, supervised experience in, in dealing with mental disorder, uh, you could work part-time in a mental hospital as a ward attendant or something like that. So that there's quite an array of, of potential levels of education that could still lead you into this kind of a, um, a degree. Another more recent effect that is also utilized is what's called a team approach, where um, you may meet with a, a clinical psychologist, a neurologist, and, and a, a psychiatrist, all of whom kind of uh, combine to offer services, and so you get the, the best of both worlds in, in that kind of a um, situation. Now, one of the things we need to talk about, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly here, is the, the different types of models that are actually used in identifying mental disorders. One of these is what's called, are, are models that are based on what are called internal causes. These trace back directly to the fact that Freud was an MD. And his, as you remember, when we talked about psychoanalysis, he had an absolute determinist view. Any problem that shows up behaviorally for you and I has an internal identifiable problem. That leads to the psychodynamic, sometimes also called the medical model which is based entirely on the idea that there are internal causes of the disorder. And in this kind of a situation, the therapist is dominant. That is, a psychoanalyst does a real power trip on you. If you have problems, you tell me what's wrong and I will fix you up. That is, it's a real top-down kind of processing um, that is going on there. The contrast is what is called a model based on external causes, and it's variously labeled. Sometimes it's called simply a psychological or a behavioral model, but the humanists and existentialists also use this kind of a model. Here, the approach is quite different. Now what the psychologist is doing is positioning him or herself to say essentially, you have a problem, I have services that I can deliver to help you solve that problem. But in essence, the problem is yours. And the basic idea is that if you walk in, you know, if, if you're out uh, skiing and all of a sudden your arm gets broken so it's a right angle hanging off your elbow, you understand you've got a medical problem and you go in to get help and there's no doubt that you will. Somebody endorsing the external model or the psychological model is going to assume basically that again, you recognize that the problem is yours and in essence what is set up then is a client-based relationship where you are dealt with more as an equal and the psychologist presents him or herself as, a, as an authority that is offering various sources of help to you and will sit down with you cognitively slash diagnostically, figure out what the problem is and then develop a strategy to help you solve your problem. There's also a significant difference in responsibility which I should comment on here and that is that the medical model assumes that you're sick and somehow kind of removes responsibility from you and I for maintaining ourselves. The psychological model, on the other hand, assumes that you are sick, but that you are aware of it and that it is your problem. That is, the responsibility is left with you rather than the psychoanalyst taking it on him or herself. So there are some real psychological differences. I'll point up a couple of them as we skim through some of the therapies that are, that are available to us. Um, I'm going to skim, in the interest of time, these seven features that basically represent the, the key things that we're looking for in somebody who has mental health. This was developed by Richard Swin um, about 25 years ago and again has well withstood the test of time. These are the major things that we're looking for from somebody, for, for anybody who, among us who is uh, mentally healthy, uh, we hope. These are the kind of things we're, we're striving for here. Now. Relative to that, we've got three broad classes of psychotherapy, each of which we're going to delve into here just a little bit. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skim most of the physical therapies, but I do want to identify them for you in general and point out one rather interesting problem, and that is that the physical therapies are really or should be viewed as a means to an end rather than an end in and of themselves. And the, the reason I say that is illustrated by that vicious circle or revolving door problem. That's the one I should really cite, the revolving door problem I was talking about before. If you're homeless and out on the street and acting abnormally, at some point you get institutionalized in a mental hospital, they diagnose your systems, uh, symptoms, put you on drugs, and then release you with a prescription. And as long as you stay on the drugs, your problems are not there. But in fact, if you stop taking the drugs, the problems return. And so in essence, we have to, with one exception, view the physical therapies as a means to an end, not an end in and of themselves. 
Okay, so kind of keep that in mind as we go through looking at the various types of therapy. One of the oldest and not widely used now is what's called shock therapy. And the basic idea here is that, that what you're going to do is to shock the system in some way. Um, it's almost kind of like a Missouri farmer using a two-by-four to get his mule's attention. Um, that's almost what's involved. I mean, it isn't quite that bad, but in essence, um, one of the traditional ways, and I can speak to it with expertise on this, that used to be used was to use insulin. Uh, and if we inject a huge dose of insulin in any of you, you will go into what I used to go into before I was on an insulin pump, um, since I have diabetes, uh, is a very severe insulin shock. And in essence, the, the drugs were injected at a sufficient level to put you in, uh, to render you unconscious. And I can also report personally that in, in before, again, before I was on the insulin pump, when I used to have serious reactions, uh, insulin reactions, what, and what happens is the blood sugar level drops very low. Um, coming out of that, what I used to experience was a, an, a period of an hour or so when, when I could get things done. I mean, you're just incredibly cognitively sharp. It's kind of like when you wake up in the morning and your socks are where you expect them to be, your shoes are where you left them last night, you know, everything just kind of clicks. You and I have days like that every now and then. That's essentially what it's like coming out of an insulin reaction. That is when enough sugar is being put back into your system to, to bring the, the balance, the sugar balance, back up where it needs to be. That's one of the reasons why they use shock therapy is because of that period of heightened enlightenment uh, or alertness that occurs in the, in the, the aftermath of, of the unconsciousness. But each of the different types of, of therapy that is utilized, whether it's electric or, or chemical, um, is, is, um, a, is, is an attempt to actually create um, a, a shock within you during the recovery of which you are more susceptible to other forms of psychotherapy. And so that is, in essence, what is, what is really going on here. There are several different types of chemotherapy that have developed down through the years. Um, narcoanalysis is, is one example in which um, you're, you're being subjected to things like, uh, well, truth serum, essentially, sodium amytal, uh, sodium pentothal, and, and scopolamine are, are three examples of these kind of drugs. These are rarely used now because there, there are side effects physically uh, that can be somewhat dangerous, but the, the basic idea is that with things like narcoanalysis, um, what you can engage in is, is the ability that, that you can, you can get get somebody to, to loosen up considerably and talk to you more honestly. A psychoanalyst would say essentially that the unconscious is being freed up. But I think more generally we could say, um, more generically, we could say essentially that the, the patient is more willing to talk honestly um, about the various problems that he or she may have and the beliefs that they're carrying around with them. Um, we can look also at, at each of these types of drugs. In the interest of time, I'm going to skim these, but just point out that we have a variety of different symptoms that may present from, from traditional psychoses to anxiety problems or depressant problems, uh, problems with depression. And each of them can, in one way or another, be handled by drugs, treated by drugs, neutralized or, or rendered less powerful, essentially. Um, the evaluation generally in these forms of therapies is, is, um, is somewhat mixed. Um, the benefits involve, of course, the, the decrease of extreme kind of psychotic slash schizophrenic reactions, increased susceptibility to other forms of therapy, um, and things like that. Reduce uh, um, severity of the need for control in hospitals. I mean, tranquilizers themselves have significantly reduced the number of people that even have to be in um, state-controlled mental hospitals. Um, but there are some side effects. There, there are some drawbacks. And one of those is, is side effects that are caused by the drugs in some cases. Um, what you're really doing is controlling rather than curing the condition. That's also a problem with all of the physical therapies, save one I'm going to get to here in a minute. And one of the arguments there is, are you really treating the symptoms or are you treating the cause? And some would argue, I think quite persuasively, that drugs do nothing more than treat the symptoms rather than actually dealing with the central problem or cause or whatever the cause of the, of the disorder is. And you have to be aware of the placebo pro effect. That is, people may get better simply because they think they're taking drugs, so I must be getting better. Um, and so there are some real serious diagnostic problems that we have with, with um, the efficacy of, of chemotherapy. Um, drawbacks I've talked about. Let's look then at one other, which had a, a very abusive introduction and, and, uh, to psychology originally, but that's the idea of psychosurgery, which we talked about once before back in, in pain suppression, uh, when we were dealing with it in motivation and motion. I said at the time I would come back to it, and the, the use of what's called uh, psychosurgery or a frontal lobotomy basically has a very interesting effect. What happens is that you create essentially emotional flattening 
if you sever the very front part of the frontal lobe from the rest of the brain. And the net result is that the, the, the highs and lows that would be typical of somebody with a bipolar disorder, manic at one point and seriously depressed at another, that cycling essentially goes away. They're just kind of there. But it's described, uh, one patient I, I interacted with at one point described it as kind of a medium gray. You don't get particularly excited about anything. You don't get particularly worried about anything. You're just kind of there. And so in, as a kind of an extreme example of treatment of pain, it can be very beneficial. The side effect then is that you lose affect, basically. That is, you're just kind of there. There are no whoopies. There are no depressions. You're just there. Um, so in the instance of pain treatment, the, the elimination of highs and lows is a side effect. In the interest of psychotherapy, the, the elimination of highs and lows becomes a benefit because if you're on a, on a kind of a manic depressive cycle, you are a serious danger to yourself. I mean, a manic is very likely to give away their entire uh, wealth because, you know, they have no ability to critically analyze. You give them any kind of harebrained idea for investment. Oh, yeah, here, I'll give you a, a check for my life savings. Sounds great to me. Let me know what happens. And in essence, you've then given away your entire life savings. So there, there are dangers. And the frontal lobotomy is one way to, to take care of that, what's often called psychosurgery. It is not frequently used now because it is a very extreme form of therapy. But it does have some predictable uh, side effects under, under proper conditions. And finally, then, let's look and spend the rest of the time looking at the talking or reinforcement-based therapies. Um, the therapy involves here. First of all, search is a search for blocks to, to normal kinds of behavior. That's one of the ideas that we're envisioning here is that we're looking for whatever it is that's holding you back from doing whatever you would, you would normally do. And in psychoanalysis particularly, what we're looking for is what is called a catharsis. A catharsis is basically a release of emotional energy. Going back to the analogy, you remember I talked about the fact that you need to move your psychic energy when you're born through oral, anal, phallic, and the latent stages to arrive at adult life with all of your psychic energy available to you. And what a psychoanalyst says happens is that if you get fixated at one of the earlier stages, you overinvest psychic energy, either because things were so easy or because things were so frustrating. Either way, that energy is not available to you in adult life, and it shows up instead as symptoms often reflected in defense mechanisms and so forth. So what psychoanalysis is trying to do therapeutically is reach back into childhood, analyze what the problem was, get you to relive it and experience it, and then relive with an adult level of appreciation what was done to you in childhood. And that is the correct uh, preposition to use there, was done to you in childhood, and have you relive the experience, creating then what is called a catharsis. And a catharsis is essentially a release of emotional energy. That is essentially what's going on in that case, freeing it to have it flow forward to adult life. Now, the elements of therapy are very straightforward. Traditionally, a couch was used. More often now, it's a chair, because uh, psychotherapy generally has shifted much more toward a cognitive approach um, and picked up on only some elements of what, what is involved in, in traditional um, psychoanalysis. Um, secondly, free association is often used. And this is a very interesting uh, element of, of psychoanalysis because in essence, in, in, in free association, what we're actually looking for is areas of repression. That is, if you falter on a given word, if you don't have a, a reaction immediately to, to a word association task, the, the let me back up a second since I'm still talking about that. Um, you're really dealing there with, with an area that you may be repressed about. That, that, so the, the free association is often timed in terms of how rapidly you respond and what the responses are that you give. And in essence, if, if it's known that you have both a brother and a sister and your associations to things like family or brother or sister result in one case in a lot of information and in the other case in almost no information, <coughs> excuse me, that's a hint that you've got an, an element, an area of resistance in there of repression that needs to be followed up on. Dream contents are also involved. Uh, the analyzing of dreams psychologically in terms of what the, the, um, the symbolism is um, that is actually involved in that kind of a, um, a situation. Psychologists talk about the actual dream itself as being what is called the manifest content. That is how you would describe it to a friend. What the psychoanalyst is interested in is what's called the latent content of the dream. Hear me when I say there is no absolutely no psychological evidence that dreams have latent content. There is simply none. A dream is a dream is a dream is probably the best way to think about it. It may be interesting. It may yield kind of insights for the psychoanalyst. But in fact, there is no latent content that has ever been independently demonstrated. 
Fourthly, uh, whoops, and I keep popping past what I want to talk about here. Let me back up. Resistance um, is is the the area where where a psychoanalyst is going to be particularly interested in trying to figure out what it is that you're afraid of and trying to resist. And then finally, the one thing that a psychoanalyst will be watching for is transference. That is, one of the ideas in psychoanalysis is that you will tend to select as a psychoanalyst the kind of person who was the authority figure or pleasure figure in your earlier life. Okay? And because of that, what happens is that as that person, as that psychoanalyst, reaches into your earlier childhood and begins to unloosen these, these memories that have been seriously repressed, what happens is you start treating that person as you were dealt with by that authority figure in your childhood. And the result is if it was pleasure sources that caused you to fixate energy early on, you're going to then fall in love with your psychoanalyst. If, on the other hand, it was anxiety-based source, uh, I shouldn't say that, if it was repression of some sort, if, if it was difficulty, aggressive problems, frustration, then you're going to end up hating your psychoanalyst. In both cases, what that results in is what's called transference. That is, the emotions, before you fully understand, are transferred from the, the figure in your childhood life to the adult psychoanalyst. And so a psychoanalyst will be very carefully watching for transference and would never ethically respond. Because morally, what you're doing there, ethically, what you're doing is hitting a person at their absolute intellectual weakest. Because you're simply following up on, on the weakness that was created in their personality, according to psychoanalysis, much earlier in life. So you would never exhibit, as a psychoanalyst, what is called counter-transference. That would be a violation of every APA ethic in existence ever. Um, but it is a signal to the, to the therapist. And so the psychoanalyst, if this kind of condition happens, will point out to the person and try to give them help in getting around the difficulty, but at the same time use it as a basis for establishing better understanding of what's actually going on. Now, um, when we look at um, the kind of, of client-centered therapy, when we look into the humanistic therapies uh, that are going on, um, this is a therapy that is based on a couple of basic assumptions. One is the idea that, that we're going to, um, we're going to the, the, the client has essentially potential for constructively altering his or her personality. So that's kind of an operating assumption when we start with this therapy. Very different, as you'll see, from psychoanalysis, because they're arguing essentially that you're, you're, you're locked in by your childhood and you have to have outside help to get around the difficulties. And the other is that the, the, the assumption that's made is, in, is that such, such alteration will occur um, if you are engaged in what is, if you are bathed in what is called unconditional acceptance or unconditional positive regard, that the way to release that is to get, engage you in, in uh, bathe you in unconditional positive regard. The elements then are first of all the unconditional positive regard of which I was talking. That it's a, secondly, it's a very accepting environment. That is, you would never hear a Rogerian clucking his tongue, oh, you should not have done that. That's evaluative and it might be interpreted wrongly as a put down or correctly as a put down. Either way, you'll never do it if you're a good Rogerian. Um, thirdly, um, in essence, you've got you, what, what the clinician is trying to establish is what's called empathic understanding. That is, you accept whatever is, is dealt with, uh, whatever is offered up, and, and what you're trying to work toward is a state of congruence. That is, where the therapist is perceived to be genuine and comes to have a legitimate understanding of what your problem is and how to go about um, solving it. The question, of course, is do all people actually have the potential for such growth and is bathing them in, in positive regard the way to release it? It's an empirical question that has not been widely studied, um, or both of those are empirical questions, basically. Um, these are some of the other therapies that are, that are widely available, and I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend any time on them. But these are traditional humanistic slash existentialist therapies. Finally, the other group that I do want to talk about are the social slash behavioral therapies. And these come in a very interesting array. But the basic idea here is, is the understanding that the difficulties that you've got are generated out of learned misbehaviors. And so in essence, what we're going to do is try and change the reinforcement contingencies here. Um, and the, the treatment itself then involves some rather interesting uh, assumptions. And the one I'm going to show you here is systematic desensitization. While I'm talking here, what I'd like you to do is actually clench your jaw and just clench it tightly for about a minute while the program ends here until I give you permission to release it. And in essence, the first thing that we do is get you to list your anxieties in this therapy. Anything that is a source of anxiety for you will write down on a three by five card. And then, the, so maybe you, you know, suppose you've got a phobia about snakes. You don't like to touch snakes. You don't like to think about snakes. You don't like to see snakes. 
You don't even like to talk about snakes. That's your list. Now what we're going to do is to rank order those anxieties. And in this case for you, it might be, I don't like to think about snakes. That's probably the least anxiety provoking. I don't like to talk about snakes. I don't like to see snakes. And there is no way I could touch a snake. Now there might be 300 cards like that that are rank ordered. But at this point, once they're rank ordered, now what we're going to do is to put you into a training session of deep muscle relaxation. Relax your eyes, your jaw, and concentrate on what you had to do, and we'll talk about that at the beginning of the next program.